So I think in the church, restoration, revival, revolution for us is getting back to God's original template mm. of the early church that turned their world upside down. Greg, um, I love what we're talking about today. We're gonna talk yeah. about revival. We're gonna talk about the Jesus revolution. And you were a part of that back in the day. Yeah. And we so desperately need a revival today within the church, within yeah. the country. Uh, people need personal revival. Yeah. But before we talk about revival, I would love to hear your personal story okay. of faith. How did you come to Jesus and what was the background behind that? Right. Well, I was uh, born in 1952. My mother was beautiful. She literally was a dead ringer for Marilyn Monroe. She was married and divorced seven times. Uh, she was a raging alcoholic. And when I say alcoholic, she passed out every night. Uh, she would get in big drunken brawls with her husbands and boyfriends in between. So I had to grow up really quick. You know, I lived with my mom for a time. I lived with my grandparents. I was sent to military school. So it was a very unusual upbringing, but it got me searching for answers at a very early age. Mm -hmm. Where some kids are just probably wondering if they'll make the football team. I'm sitting around wondering about life. Like, what is the meaning of life? It has to be better than this. Fast forward now, it's late 60s, the drug culture is coming on strong. And like many people in my generation, we believe the lie that drugs would expand our consciousness and make us more aware. In yeah. one sense, they made us more aware of how miserable we were. So I started smoking marijuana pretty much every day, taking LSD, and that went on for maybe a year and a half, and, and I had what is called a bad trip, which means you kind of flip out. You, you, I was running down the street screaming because I heard a voice saying to me, you're gonna die. I'm just like a 16-year-old kid at this point. And I looked in the mirror and I saw my face melting and I saw my skull exposed and I was so scared. And so I thought, I don't wanna do drugs anymore. I hate this. I hate this life I've chosen. So I, I was on a high school campus at Harbor High School in Newport Beach, California. And so the Jesus movement was happening. So I transferred from Corona Del Mar High School, another school in, in the Newport area over to Harbor. And I was warned when I got to the campus by my friends, watch out, there's a lot of Jesus freaks on this, uh, on this uh, campus. And I said to them, the last thing you'll ever see is Greg Glory becoming a Jesus freak. Famous last words. So one day I'm walking across the campus and I see this girl that's kind of attractive. And a friend of mine was talking to her and I thought I'd walk over and talk to them. I wanted to meet her. And I was waiting for a break in the conversation. She had a textbook for class and a notebook. Then I saw she had one of those black books with gold pages and ribbons. I went, oh no, she's a Jesus freak. And I literally thought, what a waste of a perfectly cute girl, right? So the next day <laughs> at lunchtime, I'm walking across the campus looking for this girl. And I realized now it wasn't that she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen, but I saw Jesus in her and it was like a light to me. And I saw her sitting with the Christians on the front lawn of our high school campus. So I sat down close enough where I could sort of eavesdrop on their conversation, but not like as a part of the group. And I watched them singing these songs about God. And I was very cynical because of the life I'd lived. But yet I wanted something more. And I looked at them, I thought, these people are crazy. But the problem was I knew a couple of them and I used to party with them and I'd seen the change that had happened in their life. So I couldn't dismiss them and say that they're all crazy. So then this new thought occurred to me, what if they're right? And what if it's all true? And what if you can have a relationship with God? I quickly dismissed it. There's no way that's not possible. The life I've seen, the life I've lived, no, that's like a fairy tale. Then I tried the thought on one more time. Well, yeah, but what if it is true? And I'm sort of contemplating this, and this guy named Lonnie Frisbee is like this hippie evangelist. Honestly, he looked like Jesus. His hair was parted in the middle, he had a beard, he stands up, and he begins to speak, and he really got my attention. And it was one statement that jumped out at me when he said, Jesus said, you're for me or against me. I looked around at the Christians, I thought, well, they're definitely for him. I'm not one of them. Does that mean I'm against Jesus? You know, Kirk, I always believed mm. in Jesus. I mean, I believed he was there somewhere. Uh, I'd seen all of his movies. <laughs> I admired him as a figure, but I never thought of him in a personal way. And then this guy, Lonnie, says, if you want to ask Christ to come into your life, get up and walk forward. And some kids walk forward. I thought, 
There is no way I would ever do that. Next thing I knew, I was standing up there. I don't even remember getting up and walking there. Just boom, I was there. Mm -hmm. And I prayed this prayer and I asked Christ to come into my life. And that was 1970 and that was the day that my life changed radically from that moment forward. That's Hasn't awesome. changed. And I, can, I can relate to, to some of the things that you're saying when I came to faith in Christ and my understanding of my need for him yeah. grew and deepened as I read the Bible yeah. and as I began to respond in yeah. faith. Uh, one of the things that happened to me as well was I began to be more interested in evangelism. Yeah. And obviously evangelism is at the center of your yeah. heart. What drew you into that realm of ministry? Well, I think um, I, I can't explain it exactly because I wasn't the person in class who liked to be in front of the class. I wasn't a person who liked to give speeches. I was more of a troublemaker, a joker and a mocker and, and a cartoonist. And my sole aspiration in life was to become a professional cartoonist. I wanted a comic strip and the paper that, and I wanted that probably from when I was around 11 or 12 years old and was working at it already. So when I became a Christian, I saw these like uh, the what well, are called tracks, but you know things that would be handed out in the day, and they yeah. were all just to me they didn't connect, because I even read some of them as a non-Christian when I was getting high and laughed at them. So I thought I want to draw something that will connect with people. So I drew this little booklet called Living Water, and I went to Chuck Smith, who was the pastor of Calvary Chapel, said, Chuck, I was listening to one of your sermons the other day at church, and I drew this little cartoon booklet that shares the gospel. And he liked it so much, he had me redraw it in a proper format to be printed, and that was printed, and so that was my first step into evangelism. And so I thought, great, I'm just gonna do uh, drawings and give these out to people and and you know live that way, but then I began to realize that God was giving me a gift to communicate and to speak. And I found I was finding more joy in talking with people than sitting behind a drawing board all day and trying to come mm. up with a new idea. So this is when, I, you know, God gives us gifts. We, he gives us talents and he gives us gifts. Supernatural gifts aren't always related to who we are as a personality. God may call the most unexpected person to do the most unexpected thing. Yeah. Like me, being a preacher and being a teacher. I, I'm a Bible teacher and I, yet I was the worst student. But at the same time, this is something God called me to do. Yeah. So that's how it started. You mentioned earlier when you were sharing your faith story uh, about the Jesus movement and uh, some, some call it the Jesus Revolution. Yeah. For those who aren't familiar with that, can you explain what is the Jesus Revolution? Well, there's this Time Magazine cover. Um, the, Time Magazine dubbed it the Jesus Revolution. Back in the day, we called it the Jesus Movement. And I think actually Time Magazine understood something even we didn't understand. This was a revolution. You know, back in the late 60s, there was a lot of talk of revolution. The Beatles even had a song, Revolution. And the idea was, you know, overthrow the government. Young people have all the answers. Let's change everything. And so when things were really dark, God sent a spiritual awakening. There was a Time Magazine cover in the late 60s. It was a black cover with reversed out red letters with an ominous statement, is God dead? Question mark. A few years later, that cover comes out, Jesus Revolution. What a difference a few years make and what a difference a spiritual awakening makes. Mm. And that's what happened. God sent this awakening, this revival. So when I became a Christian in 1970, I didn't know what an awakening was. I didn't know what a revival was. I didn't even know what church was. And so when I went to church for the first time at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, which was in the throes of the Jesus movement, I walked smack dab into the middle of a spiritual awakening. And it wasn't until later I realized it, but Time Magazine very astutely described it as a revolution. So I think in the church, restoration, revival, revolution for us is getting back to God's original template mm. of the early church that turned their world upside down. And, and that Jesus revolution was really taking place strongly here in Southern California, and yeah. you were a part of that. Do you have any favorite memories of what was going on during that time that you think back to? Yeah, well, you know, it, to me it was like, <clears throat> there was just a very special feeling when you walked into it. Um, no one was ever late for church. Everyone was early because there were no seats. And you walked into this tiny little sanctuary that was overflowing 
with a lot of young people, but people of all ages, there was a sense of, a, of anticipation, excitement. Uh, contemporary worship music was being born right there mm. because it really didn't exist. Prior to this time, it was like, you know, your basic hymns and maybe your occasional sort of sing-along song like you would do at a camp. Campfire. But we didn't have what we would call worship music as we know it today. Like what we would sing, a, a song by Chris Tomlin or Phil Wickham or, or all these songs we sing today, that didn't exist yet. Uh, for that fact, contemporary Christian music did not exist. Most churches would have a key, uh, piano on one side, an organ on the other, and the occasional odd acoustic guitar, you know. But all of a sudden, we have electric guitars, amplifiers, drum kits. And I watched this happen before my eyes, so it was very exciting to us. Mm. And and it's the, the memories are very strong still. And, and I pray that, this happens again. I know it would feel different because we're in a different time culturally, yet I do find parallels between the time we're in right now mm. and the early 70s. Really strong parallels. Hey, thanks for watching my interview with Greg Laurie. Please like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you never miss another episode. And if this video made an impact on your life, share it with a friend so others can enjoy it. And then drop a comment so our community can celebrate together.